going out. I 
Hey Jim, do you have your clicker? Um, I might have it in the car. Do you need it? Um, I think I don't know if we have. I don't know that we have a bunch. We I think we just have this. And, uh, so I think we're okay.
Uh, da, da, da. So I will tell you that our event, the Sustainable Apiary, is June 4th, Saturday, June 4th, which is not very far away. It's a half day event out at Tea or Organic Farm, which is where we always have our uh, summer field day. Uh, so the event bright link is going to be put on our Facebook page probably tonight, maybe tomorrow. Um, but you'll sign up for that. I think it's twenty dollars. That includes your lunch, um, box lunches, and water. Okay. And yes, good deal. Yeah. Go ahead. What's the time on that? So I, I think it's nine to two. But we cannot get there before nine. There's an event at the farm until that time. So we can't come early and we can't stay late. So just know it's uh, usually it's a little more relaxed, but I think they like have a wedding and they have an overnight thing until that. So nine to two, nothing else. Bookends. Bookends, that's right. And this is a field day event. So bring your suit, bring your at least a bail. Um, <clears throat> They have the sign, and we'll be getting into Jim Burns beef. So if they're horrible, this is the man that you're going to talk to. Well, they're getting the sticks. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, we had a super exciting week this week. We've been lots of bees. Anybody been stunned by a bee this week besides me? Good deal. That means, you know, when I was a riding instructor, we would tell people if you haven't fallen off your horse, if you haven't been riding long enough or hard enough. So mm -hmm. you have been stunned by bees. It's part of it. So glad to see that. Um, uh, we're trying to schedule this so that we'll have plenty of time for Q&A with um, Randy Oliver at the end. You might jot your question down so you remember exactly what it is, and we'll try to be brief to get through as many questions as we can. I hope we have good questions. Um, Time's up. Okay, I'm done. <coughs> Is that it? Time for Dave. Anything? Okay. I yeah. Hey, Stony Lane you know, Apiary Rescue. I don't know too much about this other than the fact that oh. I volunteered to go out and you were the move man. some rocks. Oh, you were the man. So, so there was a, a, a young lady who's had 12 to 14 hives. 14 hives? She is a member of our club. She's a member of the club. She was just done with beekeeping. And well, that happens. She did she's all the right got, things and got to 15. Yep. So she's, that's why. She, she did a lot of beekeeping over the years, but now she's got more animals at the farm and everything else that she wanted to be. It got rid of it. So we got rid of it before, and she wanted them to go to a good place. Um, we do have one of the hives out here that will be raffled off. And so that is up the road here at our little apiary. So one of them is from there. The rest of us took hives and put them in the back of pickup trucks and vehicles and whatever. Tracy brought her big, whatever it was, her big trailer, and we had all the bees packed back there. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, only had one incident with one hive where we forgot to strap down and move it and if you've got a big stack of bees all that you don't strap it and try moving the first it breaks open it broke open they were not happy <laughs> so i took my suit off it was the last moment i took my suit off i cooled it off in the car i need some water i was done five or ten bees this is 150 feet away just hammer me so boom 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 all in one spot and then other people were doing this i've had 150 bees or other bees too. it happens um you gotta be gentle around hives that was just a mistake where they moved it and Bees didn't like. Overall, the bees were incredibly gentle. We had a couple of cool things that came out of that. One was one of the hives, we looked at the front of it, there's two queens. So they're probably virgin queens that hatched. They were sitting right on the outside of the hive, just hanging out. And we were like, there's two queens. I had a couple cages. We caged a couple. And I took one and somebody else took one. Miles Spamberg takes one. Yeah. The other cool thing, and this is in the bees, and Dave Book has talked about swarms and how cool a swarm is and how gentle the bees generally are. We were moving one of the hives to a gentleman Miles' house. So we have a beehive, we're moving it. You look in the air, and there's a hive over his house, or a swarm over his house. So he had a swarm right over his house while we were moving a new beehive in. It found a beehive, an older beehive we had that was empty. While we were moving the hive, that swarm moved down into the other hive. It was unbelievable. It was super magical. It, it was wow. up, I'm like, you kidding me? It happened right in front of our eyes at that point in time. It was, it was amazing. He should have bought a lot of tickets. Um, I don't know if he did, but he should So, anyway, May, June, I'm Dave Zubkowski, Dave Z. I'm a five year beekeeper. First year with Langstrop Hives. I've done a bunch of top bars under the tutelage of Jim Burr. Um, so, I'm learning this. I've got beautifully painted, I've got a neighbor who's nursed. So I had to show off my latest thing. So getting a lens drop, I said, why not do something fun? So my neighbor's an artist. She's like, Dave, I'll paint your hive. I don't want to look at a white hive. 
So I said, here, have it. So she painted this beautiful hat. Kind of funny. Purists out there are saying that's disgusting and pathetic. Whatever. I agree. So anyway, what are bees doing? So right now, everybody's come in here and just walked in. You smell black locust, honey locust. I don't know the difference. They smell awesome. Both of them are really cool. Um, they're blooming like crazy. If you look around anywhere around Indiana right now, you see trees full of flowers. It's not the catalpa yet, but we're coming to more bees. It's not the tulip trees, those are kind of yellow, and it's an Indiana State tree. You'll see these trees that are full of white flowers. They're back here, there's some over here, you'll see one off in the distance there. The bees love locusts, they are packing them out, so they like it for honey and nectar, for honey or nectar, excuse me, and for, uh, and for the pollen. So that's a nice tasting honey. I don't know, but it's one of the great spring honeys. Um, so that's what's going on right now. Uh, swarming, who's seen swarms or had high swarm? All of us that have bees, no matter how good they are, you probably have some swarm cells or swarming. So the bees are expanding. The colonies are growing really fast right now. Um, this is the time of the year. There's more bees in the hive for the next month than there will be at any time of the year. June and into early July in this area, that's your maximum bee production. So they are building up fast. Um, I've seen queen cups and cells. You want to look for those. You know, if you start seeing some queen cups, you still have a queen in there or a queen cell. I make a split. That's 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 the bees' way of telling you, hey, we're getting full here. So you can do some other things in carve out or remove the swarm cells, but that seems like a waste unless you uh, there's people out there probably like queen or queen cells. So trying to split up it. Um, drones, I see more drones coming in. There's not tons of them yet, but there's definitely drone production, which means they're it's mating season for the, the, for the bees. Um, varroa mites, too. I know we right now we're focused on honey production. Because right now is the time there's a lot of blue for the next month and a half, but the roll mites are building too. So you shouldn't really treat right now. Ideally, you've already done that because your honey super should be on. <laughs> um, if you have to, and you do, and you find that you got a hive or a, a mite issue, you know, oxalic gas is probably the best. You just take your supers off. I think Dave might know better than I. But you take your supers off, treat it, you put your supers on after that. It's Probably the only chemical that you can really use like that. You can use formic code with the super zone. Formic acid with the super zone, that's the other one. There's a temperature constraint there. And I don't really know that too well. And that's something that's a lot of stuff out there. There's experts in the club that know that. But ideally, you take care of the mites, and it's not too bad right now. And you let the bees do their thing. And you're out of time. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> you're out of time. <laughs> what should you be doing? So, high inspections every two weeks. Back. <laughs> Tell the active queen. I just talked fast. I saw all you. Look for signs of the disease. Disease and mite count. Add supers. Um, that's all the things. New hive splits. All right, go, go. This is all posted, by the way. Right. I think it's on our Facebook page. It's not I know where you put it. The group. Yeah. It's not our page. And include queen excluders. If some people like them, some don't. I don't know. If, if I want to build comb, I found out that they do not build comb well through an excluder. So if I've got just undrawn comb, I've got I'm drawing at foundation only. The bees don't like to go through there as well to just draw that out. I don't know why. I've heard other people say that. That's what I've got going. Uh, so I remove it if I want to draw a comb out. If I've got a drawn comb, put the excluder in and let those bees just work. Making splits. There's tons of stuff online, guys. We've had a lot of talks on those. Now's the time to do that. There's lots of ways to make splits. Three or four primary ones. Um, mite treatments if you need it. Okay. Next slide, and I think we're done. And then the best is the, and here's the swarm that we're talking about, miles. So there's a swarm that I had near my hives. It's probably one of mine. And then there's miles. While we were moving his beehive hive bed, he had a swarm come down and land right out of the hive, which is pretty cool. So that's it. Happy beekeeping, folks. We got a full day today. Sorry, I went a little long. I forgot to mention that we were going to raffle off one of those hives that we rescued. It was the last one. So we have it here on the property. Um, the tickets are going to be $20 per. It's full of bees, uh, two deeps and a super. Um, had brood in it. We'll get, we're going to get in it this week and confirm everything's cool with it. But you're getting uh, 30 drawn cone cranks, um, lots of bees. So $20 per ticket. We're not doing it tonight. I have tickets with us. But, and they'll have, we'll have to reach the minimum of $250 before we'll give it away. So just so you know. When are you doing it? When are we doing it? When we reach $250. Well, no. When are you doing Take this? We can't do it. Our tickets are here tonight. We'll probably do it. So we'll probably do it. We can probably do it at our team meeting. 
do it at the yield. Um, because it's the same way here in only two weeks. So, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah. But well, you, you could sell tickets there. Yeah. yeah. No, we would definitely. We could sell tickets at the end here. We can do it at the next meeting. Announce the winner at the meeting. Hmm. Okay. Uh, looks like we got new keeper, new beekeeper breakout with Peter Murphy. We're going into anybody new to beekeeping would like to just have a breakout session in the other room, ask questions, and just talk. <clears throat> <about it. clears throat> okay. And for those that are staying, we're going to be flipping over to Jeanette for looks like ten minutes of what's blooming. Um, yeah, it Hold will let me share the screen right now. Hang on, I'm flipping okay. back to the, we've got a new layout here tonight, sorry. There uh, stop. Where's the stop button? Jeanette? Yeah. Stop sure at the top. Right. I don't want to stop um, presenting to YouTube, though. I wanted to make her a host. Hey, Jeanette, can you see if you can um, present now? Okay. It says this will stop other screens sharing. Do I want to continue? I'm going to tell it to continue. And I'm going to find my presentation to share. There we go. Oh, you're good, Jeanette. We ought to be in business. Yep, we see it. Okay, good. Um, before I get started with what's blooming, uh, I have a couple of commercials. <clears throat> First thing is this Saturday is the Hamilton County Master Gardener plant sale. If you are interested in plants, there are approximately 15,000 of them. And I'm not exaggerating. We have 15,000 plants available. Um, native plants, we have lots of them. We usually have special tables for those. Hostas, daylilies, perennials, vegetables, water plants, some shrubs and small trees, not a lot of those. And then in addition, we have an iris bed where you could go out and choose your iris and somebody will dig it for you. So that is at the Hamilton County Fairgrounds on Saturday from eight to three. <clears throat> the next commercial is for the Young Beekeepers Awards. Um, this, the deadline is September 1st. Two divisions, senior division, ages 17 to 22. Junior division, ages 12 to 16. Um, go online to uh, the State Beekeepers Association website and uh, you'll go under programs and you'll see that. Uh, let me just say first place winner in the senior division wins $1,000. Uh, first place winner in the junior division wins $250 plus a complete Landstroth Hive setup. Um, again, deadline is September 1st. If you have applied before, reapply. Unless you have won, you're welcome to try again. Okay, so now what's blooming? Uh, Dave went through a few of the things that are blooming. Uh, what I want to do is just kind of go quickly through a few of the things that are major for our bees right now. <clears throat> and it's May. Um, some of the fruit trees are still blooming. I know my husband's peaches have finished, um, but I believe some of the cherries and things like that are still blooming. If you see fields that have not yet been plowed because it's been so wet and they are loaded with bright yellow orangey things, I know there's some right off of State Road 38 east of 37 that are just filled like this. That's wild mustard. And the bees like it. 
um, has good pollen and nectar, and it's available for only a short time because the farmer is going to plow it under. But the bees do get good pollen and nectar from it. And uh, since it's a weed and it grows just completely in a field, it's great for them because they don't have to do a lot of commuting between the flowers. They're all just right there. The tulip tree is uh, blooming this month. Um, it's often called a tulip poplar. It's not a poplar. It's actually a magnolia. It's a state tree of Indiana. And if you look at the bloom, you can see that it's a, a magnolia. Um, excellent nectar source. Uh, sometimes it just drips with nectar. Good pollen source. And um, it has a kind of a creamy white pollen. So if you see your bees coming in with that, that's probably where they've been. Right now around me, black locusts are just going crazy which is wonderful to see because they didn't bloom last year because of a late frost. Um, this is one of the huge um, honey sources for bees. Um, they just absolutely love it. My son in Kansas last year sent me a picture of uh, a black locust. He says, mom, what is this? The bees are just all over it. And they are. They just absolutely love it. Wild grapevines and domestic grapevines. Uh, very interesting. You don't think of those flowers as being just really, you know, great for us. The bees love them. Uh, you can smell this. It's sort of an astringent smell to these. And um, again, it's a creamy white pollen. And if you have wild grapevines around, if you go close to them, you'll most likely see them loaded with bees. Next month, this is a junk tree, tree of heaven. You see it growing just in vacant lots and places like that. Um, it grows anywhere. We think it's trash, the bees love it. It is invasive and it has a really kind of a brown looking pollen. Beauty berry. Now this is a landscape shrub that is probably underused here, overused in places like maybe North Carolina. Um, it has moderate pollen, excellent nectar. It's a pretty shrub, um, nice looking flowers, but it's really the real attraction for us is in the fall, it has these wonderful purple, gorgeous berries. American bittersweet. Now, be sure it's American bittersweet, not Asian bittersweet. Asian bittersweet is horribly invasive, uh, climbs all over the place. American bittersweet is much more controlled. Uh, good pollen, excellent nectar. Uh, the bees like it a lot. And we like it in the fall uh, when it looks like that. Jeanette? Yes. I'm gonna to need to cut you off. Okay, I right. think I have like one or two more. Can we do this? Yeah, go quick. Washington Hawthorne is a tree, looks like that. Great again for bees because all of these flowers are so close. Buckwheat, if people plant buckwheat, it's great. The honey on buckwheat is extremely dark. Very interesting flavor. Some people love it, some people hate it. Roses, the uh, heirlooms, the modern roses are useless. And then there's linden or basswood, whatever you choose to call it. And that blooms again in June, looking like that. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Jeanette, can you, yes. transfer, can you transfer the host back to me? I don't know how to do that, but I would. Uh, if you go to I, participants and expand out the participants. Um, okay, just a second. There's a toolbar. Participants. Okay, and, and what do I do? Right click on central 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 and, and make a host. I can do reclaim. You or North Central. There, I got it. You got it? Okay. Okay. Um, 
Did Dave? Did you have it? There was another. You had another block on the calendar. Uh, no, that was it. Oh, you did both of yours at the same I, time. I just don't line up. Oh, oh, sorry, Jeanette. I'm sorry. I cut you off. Then I was, I was, I was cutting you off to get Dave's second half. No. <laughs> Dave already did his his second half, but oh, I will apologize. I will accept your rudeness. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, um, I, I, if Randy's ready, we could we could cut to him early. Sure. There he is. Yay. Welcome, Randy. Hi, Jeanette. Very nice pictures there. I've never heard of Beauty Berry before. I'm I'm, I'm looking it up as you speak. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we've had a crazy spring here. We've gone from killing frost to 90 degrees in a week here. Yeah, and, we uh, did too. That's crazy for us. And, hey, Randy, I, I hate to interrupt you there, but is there any way that you could boost your volume a little bit? We're at max volume here, and we can. And it's coming through pretty quiet. You're at max volume. Okay, let's see. Hey, test, test. How's that? Does that make any difference? About the same. About the same. I'm going up to. I'm up in 100 percent now here. Does that yeah. make a difference? Yeah. Yeah. Did that help? Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. So uh, you guys ready to roll here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just, <laughs> I just came in from outside. I'm welding up a rack outside for, uh, and doing some plumbing. Let's see if share screen. Okay. Um, spring management. <laughs> okay. And then slideshow. <laughs> from beginning. Okay. Go. All right. So, my, this presentation is not not about honey production. I, I don't live in a high honey production area, um, and uh, so I'm not really qualified for making for a high honey production. Unit. We're we're lucky, you know, if we make 100 pounds, but more more often it's about 35 pounds um, per hive. But so what I'm going to do is go over uh, preparing for honey production because once you have the colonies ready <laughs> and you got the flowers. Uh, they're going to make, make honey. So the main thing is to get your colonies ready. So what I'm going to focus on is getting your, your colonies uh, ready. Um, so we're talking about this, this time of year in the uh, springtime when we're going from the winter cluster, the old bees out here, to the younger bees. This, this graph here shows the age structure of a hive. This is, uh, those of you who aren't familiar with my, my website, the total colony, this is from Manitoba, Canada, uh, data from Lloyd Harris from 1976 where he tracked the age of the bees in the hive and the amount of brood in the hive. So the total colony population is along the top line of the graph. So that's 50,000 uh, bees right there. The total amount of brood in the hive, eggs, larvae, and pupae is the dotted line right here. And then he has the age structure of the hive broken down in 12 day increments, so uh, uh, the capping period, the post capping period. So these are bees that are, have emerged zero to uh, 12 days of age 13 to 24 days of age, 25, 36, and very few bees live beyond 48 days during the spring or summer. Down here at the bottom is your average age of a worker in the colony. So we go from being over uh, 100 days old here, and some of these workers being up to 200 or more days old um, up in Manitoba, um, down to we're all teenagers <laughs> right here. The whole colony shifts from a bunch of geriatric bees to a bunch of very young bees, and all during the summer, you never get up to over about 22 days average age uh, for the workers in the hive. So it's a very different population structure during the summer, uh, spring and summer than it is during the uh, winter. So we're gonna focus upon this period of time from the be beginning of the main honey flow, which would be right here um, uh, from the uh, coming out of winter right here. So the honeybee colony, the uh, objective of the honeybee uh, colony, hang on, let me move something out of here and more. Uh, hide that. Okay. Um, the objective of the honeybee colony, the, the, the niche, has two main objectives, and that is to store enough food to survive dearth. So honeybees, unlike other insects, store food to eat when it's when there's no forage or when it's cold, either one. So they store food for the summer in uh, dry areas, that, like where I live. They store uh, food for the winter in colder areas, such as where you live. Um, and thus honeybees, this is their, their energy source they store. So their number one goal for honeybees, always keep in mind, is to store honey. They will always want to store honey. Now, luckily, that's the same objective that beekeepers have. So you can work very easily with your bees to get them to store honey. 
The second objective is that once these colonies have gotten strong enough or have filled the cavity that they're living in, then the only thing they, for them to do is to reproduce as much as they possibly can, get their genes out into the environment. So they produce a, a ton of drones and will swarm as frequently as they can build up their population. So in a small cavity, they will swarm several times a year. That objective is contrary to the beekeeper's objectives. You don't want your colonies uh, to swarm. So um, you work with the bees on the honey production against the bees in the swarming. So that's what this presentation will largely be about. So if you're going for honey production, your goal is to reach maximum strength without the colonies swarming. If they, if they swarm, you lose, lose part of your uh, field force. Uh, another goal might be to make increase, uh, increase your number of colonies and make up for deadouts or to sell bees. Here's, here's me and my sons working on our, on our, our Nuka semi line, and uh, we'll be talking about making nukes. That's, that's largely what, what we do is we sell a lot of nukes every year. So the quandary, the challenge for every beekeeper is one, you want to build your colonies up in strength to coincide with the beginning of the honey flow. And two, you don't want the colonies to be set back by getting there too early and having them swarm. So it's all about your timing and working around uh, the weather. And this, this year, the weather is <laughs> just, uh, I don't know about you guys, but we, this is probably the worst weather conditions I've seen in at least 20, maybe 40 years out here. It's just been really a struggle uh, for us. Every now and then, that, that will happen. <clears throat> so I, I drew uh, three seasons here, season one, two, and three. Here's your colony population, the black line right here. And this is your nectar and pollen flow. This is for my area. Korea, uh, up here in Northern California, and I did not put any dates on here because colony buildup and decline are independent of date, independent of day length. Even though you can read in all the books and everything saying, oh yeah, when the days get shorter, the bees do this, the bees get longer, they do that. It has nothing to do with day length. There's never been any scientific study that's ever shown that it's an effect of day length. And if you live, uh, if you were to live in Southern California or in Mexico, you're Dearth period here, instead of being in, in uh, November through um, February uh, for, for where you guys live, the dearth period starts in July and ends in November. Springtime in Southern California, as far as bees are concerned, starts in November, and that's when they start building up. So it has nothing to do with day length. Right? I, what really got me to realize that is I was visiting Australia, uh, beekeeper there, on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. We went out to one of the bee yards on a white box nectar and pollen flow. And these colonies were just booming at maximum strength, whitening comb, putting on a honey crop, huge walled wall brood on the shortest day of the year. And that's where I realized <laughs> all the books are wrong. Uh, they were just written by people up in the, in the uh, Eastern United States, not in other parts of the world. So anyway, no matter where you are, this is what it looks like independent of date or day length. When there's nectar and pollen coming in, then colonies build up. When there's no nectar or pollen coming in, colonies go into survival mode. So they go through three phases during the year. The first phase is once nectar and pollen start coming up is the build up mode. And that's when they go from their low po overwintered population to build their strength up um, towards getting ready for the main honey flow. When they're about two thirds full and when they max out on brood production, uh, then they go into the reproduction uh, mode if, if weather permits and, and in season uh, permits. Uh, this is swarming at this period of time. Then they quickly recover their population, we'll go over that. And then they get, want to get ready for the food storage mode. Ideally, they maximize their population right at the beginning of the main honey flow. If they maximize it too early, they can starve to death before the honey flow starts. If they maximize it too late, then they'll have a bunch of extra mouths to feed and they miss out on the main honey flow. So natural little populations of bees are adapted for timing their buildup to, uh, to coincide with the uh, local main honey flow. Once the main flow is over and uh, very little nectar or pollen come in, they go into the dearth mode, which as I said, if it's in a dry area, it starts in summertime. If it's in a cold area, it starts in fall. And then they go into this, uh, drop their population and go into survival mode until the build-up mode starts again. So what we're gonna be looking for is this timing right now is what we're gonna be focusing on. <clears throat> so here's my house. Um, um, uh, back when we used to get more snow, we, we get some <laughs> snow now, but we don't normally get a snow like uh, this anymore. This used to be the norm just not too many years ago. And the bees are all in winter cluster. You don't have to uh, worry about them much. Now, 
they will start initiating a little bit of brood rearing as the temperature warms a bit. They can't do too much because they don't have enough reserves unless they have a bunch of bee bread stored in the combs. So if you live in an area where you get a large pollen flow in the fall and they do store a bunch of bee bread, then they can do some brood rearing during the winter or in the springtime. They have a little bit of protein stored in the fat bodies of the winter bees. But when I do the calculations, there's only enough uh, protein in the fat bodies to uh, takes about three adult bees to rear one larva one time uh, from what they have from their own reserves. So they can't do much from their own body reserves. And so what we're looking at here, this is, um, I shifted the axis here to put January here in the middle. So uh, during this winter period of time, there's almost no attrition of the uh, colony workforce until we start getting into the springtime with the first pollens coming uh, in here, right here. We'll return to this here. So here is uh, back to the, the normal axis here. Uh, first pollens for us is alder pollen uh, starts coming in usually the second week of January in my area. And that initiates the first brood rearing. Uh, up there in Manitoba, it started in May. And you see the first brood rearing uh, starting right here and the colony shifting from winter bees to uh, summer bees. Now, one of the things you can do for any club anywhere is to make a phenological table like this um, for the beginners. And, uh, and you can leave the dates, you can put them on here for general reference, but like where I live, you know, if I drive 20 minutes either direction, I, I can change a full month in, in a season because we live in the mountains. So elevation is everything. So um, having a phenological table, whereas instead of dates, what you have is um, the actual bloom of the plants, um, just like uh, what Jeanette was just talking about with the uh, bloom, you can track this phenologically and then over that, you can, you can lay over, overlay what your typical colony population buildup is, when your swarming season is, when your peak population and main honey flow are, and, and um, put in swarming, put in any, like we have a toxic pollen that comes in at this time, the buckeye. We have a dearth over here. We have a dearth right after the apple bloom in our area. And then you know that from, once the bees establish the brood nest, it's about 60 days typically until they swarm. And then another 30 to 60 days, to the main honey flow. In general, it, you know, every environment is, is mm -hmm. different. So you make this up for your own location. Once you've made this up, you can overlay it with a management plan. And this would really help your beginners out if they all had this. So this is the management plan that I give to our beginning beekeepers in my county in the foothills. This tells you when you need to avoid starvation, when you may, might, need to feed, might need to feed a little protein, when you need to be proactive with Varroa, when you should look for European bow brood, when you want to um, split your colonies to avoid swarming, when you can draw a comb, the only time of the year around here you could draw a comb. Um, so, and this is both, um, if you go to my website to beginning beekeeping and look for first year beekeeping, this graph is on there. And you can duplicate this for, for your club to help people out. Now, the first thing to understand is that everybody thinks about the queen being the special bee in the colony. The queen is the only normal female bee in the colony. The special bees are the, are the workers, the, the females that don't try to reproduce and who spend their lives instead of having babies themselves, they, they raise their sisters from their, their mother. That's the unusual bee in the colony, not the queen bee. The queen is pheromonally the heart of the colony and she's the mother of all the bees. But other than that, she doesn't, uh, tell anybody what to do. She doesn't call any shots at all. The bees that run the show are the nurse bees, the bees from about three days old to maybe 15 days of age, depending. They call all the shots because they're the ones that control the food supply of the colony. They're the only ones that feed larvae or feed the queen or feed older bees that are begging for food and they feed them jelly. But the main thing they do is they make a decision every time the queen lays an egg well, first, they decide whether or not the queen's going to lay eggs by whether or not they feed her jelly. If they don't feed her jelly, she's not going to lay any eggs. The second thing is once she lays eggs, they decide whether they want to feed that larva when it emerges or whether they're just going to cannibalize the eggs and young larvae. And there's, in, in my area, uh, starting in August, they're, they cannibalize the eggs as fast as the queen lays them. The queen can lay in a thousand eggs a day and they cannibalize the eggs right, right behind her every day. You don't see any young brood in, in the colony. So the Nurse bees run the show. And this is the thing to understand for spring management. It's not about the queen. It's not about um, anything else. It's about 
than nurse bees, learning what the nurse bees respond to and how to handle uh, that. <laughs> so they respond to, to a couple of main cues. Cue number one is the incoming pollen placed next to the brood, not in that band around the brood nest, but right next to the brood cells. Okay, and the reason is, is that jelly production, this jelly here, which is critical to raise the next generation of bees, requires a bunch of protein, also energy, also sugars, but many protein, which they get either from pollen or a pollen substitute. <clears throat> what they need is they need this um, uh, uh, in, uh, unbroken supply of incoming pollen placed right here next to the brood in the center of the brood nest. That's the cue for the nurse bees. And the reason I keep saying the center is here's a, a study uh, uh, done in uh, 1974 where he, uh, Dow put pollen patties, uh, natural pollen, um, on the top bars, uh, distances from the nurse bees. So here's how far they were, uh, a half inch up, up to two inches away from the nurse bees. And then 60 seconds later, timed how many bees there were at, their, at that pollen, feeding on that pollen. And you can see it drops off really fast as soon as it gets an inch away from the nurse bees. The nurse bees are barely interested in any pollen placed more than an inch from where they are standing next to the brood. Okay, understand this, because this is critical for understanding on the uh, buildup. When beekeepers say, oh, here's the honey band at the top of the frame, here's the pollen band right here. Beekeepers often think this is where the foragers preferentially put the pollen. This is not where the foragers preferentially put the pollen. They preferentially put it right here, right in the middle of the brood. You don't notice it often as a beekeeper because the nurses eat it so fast. They eat most of that up within hours or the same day. Any pollen you see out here is, is extra, it's surplus. To the nurse bees, this is like having a bunch of canned food in that closet off to the side of your kitchen that you haven't looked at for two years. It's a food reserve. You know you're not going to starve, but it's not stimulatory for rearing brood. The pollen needs to be produced right, uh, put you right in the middle of the brood nest to be stimulatory for uh, rearing brood. That's the cue that they look for. It also requires a ton of water. If you look at this, this, um, this jelly right here, it's mostly water. So when uh, colonies are rearing brood in the springtime and it rains, the colony gets very, very thirsty. And it seems counterintuitive to think, oh, wow, it's raining outside. It's soaking wet, all the grass is wet. And you're, when it, here's what you can do. Go out in the morning after it's been raining, and if it, if it stops raining and the bees come out of the hive, look to see where they go. They don't go to flowers, and they don't go to water drops in the grass. They go to their favorite watering hole, and they will flock to that at first flight because they are dying of thirst, despite the fact that it's been raining for two days. Okay, So keep that in mind. Jelly production takes a lot of water. When it's raining, the water foragers are not foraging and the, and the nectar foragers are not bringing back fresh nectar. So, they're, so the nurses run out of water. Okay, so they need to have abundant moisture in their guts in order to produce the, uh, the jelly. <clears throat> and, and it starts, and uh, Dr. Karl Krelsheim in, in Germany did an experiment with observation hives where he placed a lawn sprinkler, turned it on, over the top of the hive, and he looked to see how much, how often the nurses were feeding their the larvae, jelly. And he found out within an hour of turning on the sprinkler overhead, they start cutting back on the amount of jelly. That's how important that cue is for incoming pollen being placed right in the middle of the brood nest. So here's a picture of me treating my bees better than I treat my own children. And these are my two sons, Eric and Ian. And when they grew up, and it was miserable outside in the springtime and raining or snowing. They knew you put on your foul weather gear and you get out and you take care of your bees. And out here where it rains a lot in the springtime, we will often work in the springtime 30 days in a row wearing full foul weather gear and rubber boots, working in the pouring rain every single day, raining or snowing, okay? Somebody once asked me, said, Randy, you out there feeding your bees when it's raining or snowing? I go, well, duh, when it's warm and sunny, they feed themselves. That's what me, being a beekeeper means. It means you take care of your bees when they can't feed themselves. So um, this is when we do most of our work 
uh, and then we, the last couple of weeks when is we had the rain nonstop right during the middle of buildup. We had thousands of we had four thousand nukes on the ground that we had made, and they were all starving. And we've just madly been out there feeding uh, four thousand nucleus colonies to keep them from starving in in the rain. So now, if you are feeding pollen sub. And you guys, that's not as important for you probably, the, the big pollen flu. But if it is bad weather, then pollen subs would be very, very beneficial. Uh, we like to use soft patties rather than patties that are between um, paper sheets. So we can squeeze them down between the frames and up between the bottom bars and get them squeezed right in the middle of the brood nest. And they're more stimulatory to the bees that way. So here's a picture of a pollen patty being, I pick the, box, the upper box back up and you see how it, they just uh, squashes in between the frames. So the nurses get to it very easily. Okay, now, as far as people are always asking me about supplemental feeding. And out here in California, we often do supplemental feeding in the springtime, but we have reasons for it. So those of us who go to almond pollination, yeah, if we have bad weather in, in January, uh, early February, we'll be supplemental feeding pollen sub. But that's not something I recommend to the hobby beekeepers in my same town because if they fed pollen sub early on, this means their colonies are gonna swarm earlier in the season. They got more problems with swarming. So it depends upon what your goal is, whether or not you feed pollen sub in the spring. So the Canadian beekeepers, where they're gonna have a big honey flow very quickly and very early, if they have bad weather, they will feed pollen sub early in the spring to take advantage of that early honey flow. For us in California, we need to have our colonies at full strength on February 15th when the almonds start blooming. So we, we, we will uh, feed pollen sub if you're an almond pollinator. So that's up to you guys what your goal is, your timing. The other thing is feeding light syrup. Um, and we will feed light syrup when it's raining because that's when colonies get thirsty. And if we want the, the nurses to be producing jelly to build our colonies in the springtime, we'll make sure they have uninterrupted moisture coming into the hive. And here's a picture of uh, bees flocking to one of my waterers after, after it rained, um, just at first thing in the morning, just thirsty as can be. The other thing beekeepers are suckers for is snake oils. <laughs> and everybody's looking for some kind of magic in a bottle. They can pour into their sugar syrup or put in their hive and make all their troubles go away. And um, I've yet to find any that are uh, worth, worthwhile. So we, we, we don't use any kind of magic. We, don't do it. we use absolute minimum equipment. We cut every penny, the simplest beekeeping you could possibly do. And we've done that for many years of successful uh, with that. We don't look for any, any magic tricks. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the spring turnover, which happens right at this time of the year when we transition from the winter bees to the spring bees. So, these long-lived winter bees, they may be in uh, northern latitudes, maybe 200 days old, and they're going to, and the colony population is going to transition from old bees to uh, young bees. And that uh, this is a study by Heather Madela that shows the longevity of bees, the lifespan of them, from 100% survival down to zero. And the uh, graphs start at the um, um, uh, on the date down below here. So these are bees that emerged in mid-July. You can see in 35 days, they're all dead of old age. Uh, clear up to the ones that emerge in um, uh, late August, uh, up where, she, where she was, uh, they all die very soon. But these bees that start to emerge in October, when the pollen flow stops, as, they were, as these bees are emerging, these bees are gonna become your winter cluster and they are long lived bees through the winter until they initiate pollen or uh, brood rearing and they bingo, they go right back to this same physiology here, they die very, very quickly. And this is the, the pop problem with the spring turnover. That's your population of old bees, once they initiate brood rearing, roughly 35 days later, most of them are gonna be dead. So look at how this wide band of bee population here going down to nothing right here, starting at right after initiation of brood rearing. In the meantime, they need to rear the replacement bees to take off here. <clears throat> There's also, look here, this is the amount of brood right here, the dotted line. Here's the amount of adult bees in the hive down here. At this time, you've got twice as many bees in the hive as eggs, larvae, and pupae as you do as adult bees. Okay, this is the only time of the year when that happens. The rest of the time, you have more adult bees than you have um, 
uh, 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 brood. And we'll get back to this when we get to this, what, the impulses for swarming. So it's a race against time here to repl replace them, uh, their population before they die off. This is the most critical time. This We got hit this year during spring turnover. Uh, nectar and palm were coming in. They start uh, rearing brood. And then we had a, a, a terrible snowstorm came in, buried all the hives, uh, dropped down to 20 degrees and just shut the hives down and they couldn't get out to um, um, forage at all. So all those old bees, which had already shifted to being nurse bees, but could no longer produce uh, any jelly because there's no pollen coming in, they kept aging and it just kneecapped all of our colonies on that, that early storm. I hear this happening a lot over on the East Coast uh, too, these, win these uh, uh, <coughs> late winter storms, uh, right? If they coincide with this turnover right here, they can be devastating to the bees. And that's where you wanna get out there and work in the rain and the snow and uh, keep your bees going to maintain the momentum of buildup. Once you lose this momentum of buildup, when that train's going uphill, it comes to a dead stop. It's hard to get going again. The same with, with the beehive. <clears throat> so the six weeks prior to the honey flow is the main time to make sure it's unbroken momentum of those colonies building up. So anytime in that six to eight weeks before that main flow, we make sure that our colonies, uh, if there's a weather condition, that we're out there stimulating brood rearing to keep them building. So this would be a, um, a, an early spring, late, um, uh, I think this was like uh, late April, um, a few years ago. And we had already super, uh, we'd already uh, split all our colonies. Um, they, were, they were building up and put a second box on and then it snowed like this. Most everybody in our town, the other beekeepers, all uh, were shocked by this storm it was late for our area and they stayed inside. We got out and we started feeding our bees like crazy <clears throat> because our colonies looked like this just before the storm. They, were, they had been singles, just wall-to-wall -wall bees. We had put a second box on there, but they were living hand to mouth. They, they were hungry. Four days later after that storm, any colony we didn't feed, it looked like this. All the honey was eaten up, all the pollen the bee bread had been eaten, all the eggs and young larvae had been eaten, all that was left is some um, uh, capped over pupa that did not need feeding anymore. <clears throat> and um, these colonies just, uh, it's amazing how quickly they all went into starvation. We had the same thing happen uh, this year, uh, this sudden shift uh, to starvation. So it, it, the, the ones that we got out and were able to feed, they went ahead and made a honey crop. The ones that we uh, did not, uh, were not able to feed, most of them did not die of starvation, but they never put on enough honey that year to make it through the winter, we had to uh, supplement and feed them to make uh, winter stores. So those were a net loss for us, so those colonies, just based upon that one untimely uh, storm. <clears throat> okay, so um, this colony right here, uh, here's your honey band at the top, here's your brood, and look at how narrow a surplus of bee bread there is right here. By morning, this may be all gone. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Colonies can build up just strain, just fine, living hand to mouth, consuming every bit of pollen that's coming in during the day because the nurses don't care about there being a surplus as long as there's pollen coming in uh, right here. So you want to take, take a look um, and uh, careful. Again, if it starts raining, they're going to immediately cut back on jelly production. <clears throat> if when a colony is, is in that brood ring mode, especially in cool weather in the springtime, they go through a lot of energy. They got to keep all that brood warm and, and feed it. So starvation typically does not occur in the winter. It happens, occurs after the colony has established a brood nest in the late winter. <clears throat> and this is your typical sign of starvation. All the bees with their heads in the cells and their tails sticking out. Now we also, we will feed pollen substitute if necessary at uh, that time in the springtime if, um, if they can't fly. And here's the nurses coming right up there and, and gobbling up the pollen sub. Um, roughly a half gallon of light syrup a week and a pound of protein is what it takes to keep a colony um, just going on. So a pound of protein, that's a patty a, a week of, of protein to maintain a minimal uh, uh, degree of, of brood buildup. <clears throat> then here's uh, my sons here. We have just moved to the almond orchard. Now the almond growers, <clears throat> they don't trust the beekeepers to actually eat that they're gonna fulfill their contracts and have their bees down there. So this, this would be taken just before bloom. This would be like the uh, first week of February. 
Now, by the first week of February, if the weather's good up in the foothills where we live, we're 3,000 feet above of this elevation, we're on a full nectar and pollen flow. Our bees are just building up, looking beautiful. And the growers say, get your bees down here. And we go, <laughs> down to that desert? We're going to take them off of the nectar and pollen flow and, and take them down. To, this is what the almond orchards look like. There's nothing whatsoever for the bees to eat. The trees have not come into bloom. In two weeks, they're going to be solid white with blossoms. Okay, food in abundance, but not right now. So when we drop them off early, we put a, a three pound chunk of pollen sub on every hive to, so they'll maintain brood ring so they don't shrink in strength before grading um, uh, in the almonds. And then <laughs> in the almonds, if the weather's good, they get so much pollen coming in that they will plug out the brood nest and the queen has no place to lay. And actually then it can actually set your colony back temporarily. They'll recover from this, but um, the package bee producers uh, uh, who, who ship bees back to the east to sell to you guys, they have a really hard time if we have uh, good weather during almond bloom because the colonies will plug out and they don't have any bees emerging to shake for packages for you guys. <clears throat> okay, so your timing, back to timing again. Okay, Once the brood nest is established, that means you've got about four frames with brood on them. The, the colony goes into the linear growth phase for about 60 days. And here's data from Nolan from back in 1932. We established tons of package bees on different, different weights of them. And then uh, you start the graphs at week four. So by week four, the package <coughs> had, had a brood nest established and uh, plenty of bees emerging. But look at the buildup rates. They're just linear like this. And they build up until the the rate of uh, attrition of the adult bees from, from old age equal, reaches equilibrium with the um, uh, rate of uh, larval rearing by the uh, queen laying eggs and the nurses uh, feeding them. Um, and a good queen can lay a, a 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day during the live. Your watcher, and she can't find a cell to lay in, the eggs are gonna keep coming out. She lays about an egg a minute, 24 hours a day. Whether, whether she can find a cell or not. If she can't find a cell to put it in, the nurses behind her will pick it up and they'll eat it and they'll re recycle that protein. Now that colony population tops out when I, when I run all these figures, it's about 40 times the queen's daily egg laying rate. So if a queen can be, can be laying a, a thousand eggs a day, your colony is gonna to top out about 40,000 bees. That's about two deep uh, supers, wall to wall with bees, 40,000 bees. <coughs> She's laying 1,800 days, eggs a day. You can have these monster colonies, um, huge, huge colonies like they get up in uh, Canada. And if you look during this linear buildup phase, I calculated the net change in colony population every day. And you can see during this normal buildup phase, it's about 500 to 600 ad additional bees, adult bees in the hive every day. <clears throat> There's about 2,000 bees on to cover a deep Langstroth frame on both sides. So that means you get additional frame covered with bees net game about every four to five days. That's how fast you can expect a, a well-fed colony to grow during this time of the year. Now, for those of you who are hesitant to do a mite wash and sacrifice half cup of bees, that's 300 bees to determine your grow load, understand the queen's laying 1,500 eggs a day here, and you're gaining 500 net bees a day, if you wanna do the arithmetic in your head very quickly, that means you got a thousand bees dying of old age every single day. During this period of time when the colony is growing, you have about a thousand bees a day dying of old age. So sacrificing 300 bees to do a mite wash and, and determine your mite level is a minimal uh, setback for the colony. Young queens are more productive in general than old queens. They'll generally uh, lay more eggs and you have better colony cohesiveness, plus much less chance of swarming. Just so fall recleaning can help to avoid uh, swarming. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that the, that buildup rate, that linear uh, rate that uh, Nolan showed, is limited not only by the queen's egg laying rate, but the initial cluster size because uh, the, the uh, volume of cluster is, is four third pi r squared, pi r cubed. It's, it's a cu uh, it, the cube of the diameter um, of, the, um, of the cluster. So let's just say a, a, queen, um, a queen can lay a, uh, a fully uh, fill a Langstroth frame 
in about three days with eggs, okay, a deep Langstroth frame. So let's say you have a, a four frame cluster. Well, she can fill maybe three frames with eggs. So that takes nine days for her to completely play out with eggs. It's 21 days before the first bee is gonna emerge and there's any more cells available, which means the queen can only lay to about half her ability with a four frame cluster. So a small cluster prevents the colony from building up at its maximum. You don't reach your maximum build up till you got 10 frames covered with bees. And then at that point, then the queen can have enough room to, to lay to her full capacity. Those of us who are almond pollinators are very, very much aware of this. If we want to have a strong colony early in the year, we've got to have a big cluster going into the winter, a big cluster of healthy bees. So all your spring management starts with what you're doing in September and October as far as getting you know, a lot of brood for a big cluster to go into the winter. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So yeah, I already did that calculation for you right here. So what you, we found from when I, when I study Nolan's data and I, I, re, I often take these big data sets from scientists like USDA scientists that they'll do years worth of data collection. They'll publish all their data, thousands and thousands of numbers. I'll often rework their data and discover things that they didn't pursue that were useful. And when I rework Nolan's data, it shows very clearly that larger starting clusters grow a lot faster than smaller starting clusters. So if you wanna get ready for a, a early honey flow, you've gotta go into the winter with large clusters. And again, the queen doesn't reach her maximum egg laying till the cluster covers at least 10 frames, um, 10 frames. Okay, empty drawing comb. You, it's very difficult to be very successful at beekeeping until you have reserve of drawing comb to draw on and use. Drawing comb is really, really uh, when you can start being successful at beekeeping. So this is from Farrar, 1931. Empty combs below the brood or above a barrier of several inches of sealed honey are not used effectively for either the expansion of the brood nest or storage of honey. This was written back in 1931. Many years later, I, I, I hear um, experts say, oh, you can help to prevent swarming by putting a box of drawn comb underneath the cluster. And um, I don't know where they get that. I, I did a, um, a large trial years ago, 150 hives in this trial, where we took singles through the winter and then in the late winter, when they started, uh, when they filled that, that single uh, box, we needed to um, uh, add a second box. And because of, I was doing a trial where we were feeding bees uh, um, a, a, a snake oil. Okay, I was testing for the manufacturer. We put the drawn comb underneath the, the cluster. And out of 150 hives, every single one wanted to swarm, um, except for like two or three of them. Um, they did not at all respond to those boxes of drawn comb placed below the cluster. If you want to keep a colony from swarming, the drawn comb has to go above or within the cluster, not below the cluster. So this is where you get into reversing your brood chambers. If your bees have eaten up all the honey in the lower box and you got your whole cluster up in the upper box, then put that, that those empty drawn comb above there the warmth from the cluster comes up here and the queen will hop right up here and start laying if there's not too much of a honey band. Generally, you have a, a break right here. If there is a honey band here, we'll pull one of these frames out and drop one of these drawn combs down in the middle to make a, a pathway, a highway for the queen to work up and get into the upper box then. <clears throat> okay, understand the seasonality of different parasites. And parasites, viruses are parasites. European fowl breed is a parasite. Those are parasites. They're all parasites. <clears throat> Here's two years, the colony population. Here's your, your, uh, your nectar and pollen flow. And there's a seasonality. Nozema uh, is, is a, can be an issue in the springtime. It's not an issue during the winter, generally. European fowl brood and shock brood are both issues uh, during the cool weather of the springtime, and they just go away and disappear later in the summer. Uh, come late uh, summer, bro and deforming virus become a big problem. If you have a fall, fall pollen flow, nozema can be a problem. And then your paralytic viruses uh, during the winter. So know what to look for at different times of the year. 
So chalkwood is one that, th that slows down spring buildup, uh, has to do with the uh, uh, temperature a lot. So the bees fight chalkwood by raising the temperature of the brood nest, and that drops the oxygen con uh, concentration in the pupa by raising the temperature, and then the chalkwood fungus cannot um, uh, effectively reproduce when they've heated up those pupae. Generally, this will cure, uh, clear on its own. There's no cure that I have ever found for chalkwood, but it's a very distinctive sign of chalkwood. And it seems to just kind of come and go in waves in various years. I've never found <coughs> anything much to do about it other than requeening. Um, what we seem to have is with bees is this transgenerational immune priming. So when you have a, a variant of a pathogen, just like with the coronavirus, there's, there's variants with the, with the chalkwood, variants with our other viruses, variants with European thalbrood. When the, a variant comes in, you'll see a lot of it maybe for a year or so. And then the, the nurse bees ramp up their transgenerational immune priming and they can, just like mother, mother's milk, um, they can and transmit this to, their, to the larvae via the jelly and then whatever that, that new variant was, just tends to go away on its own. European fabric is the other thing I'm seeing a lot of, a lot more of in the last oh, de oh, couple of decades, uh, much more than I used to see, uh, where the larvae in the springtime, if you see, if you see a spotty brood pattern in the springtime these days, the first thing I look for is European fabric. And it's often hard to find a symptomatic larva. If you have a, if you have a spotty brood pattern, suspect European fabric. Uh, look, you may have to look through a few combs to find a symptomatic larva, and the, and the symptomatic larvae turn yellowish and they twist in the cells like this, and then they die. They have this unusual twisting in the cells. That's a sure sign of EFB. Luckily, all the variants I found clear up very easily with the treatment of teramycin. And then dysentery. Now, dysentery, I, people always say, oh, this means my colony's got nosema. There is no connection between causality of dysentery and nosema. No one has ever shown that nosema causes dysentery. Again, forget what the books say. They, they've all got it wrong. Dysentery is caused by other things. It's caused by uh, water imbalance. It's caused by amoeba infection. It's caused by indigestible, undigestible uh, food, but it's not caused by nosema. But if some of the bees are pooping in the hive and they also happen to be infected by nosema, that will spread nosema throughout the hive. So, Dysentery can spread nosema, but just because you see dysentery doesn't mean you have nosema. The only way you, you can uh, look for nosema is with a microscope. You've got to look for the spores at 400 times magnification. If you don't see nosema spores, <coughs> it, you don't have nosema. When I do nosema, when I do dysentery sampling, scrape it off the hive, sometimes I find nosema spores that generally it has no correlation with nosema. Um, if there's a big pollen flow coming on and the colony is healthy, Nozema is normally not a problem. Nozema serrani uh, that, we, that we see these days. Okay, swarming. Here I am with a typical California swarm right here. Um, uh, this, 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 this was one where uh, a few different colonies uh, uh, combined and then they moved from, this whole swarm moved from tree to tree and I'm standing on the ladder here. They finally stopped moving, we were able to collect this. It filled four deep, super solid, with, with bees. And uh, we had seven, seven virgin queens and balls drop out of the swarm onto the ground. And I picked them up and I started seven nukes from those drop virgin queens in addition to the whatever queens were in here. They're, the most I've ever found in a, a swarm is 18 queens at one time. So there, there's, uh, don't, don't ever think there's only one queen in the swarm. Here's the consequences of a swarm, the unwanted consequences. It's going to reduce your honey crop. It may be a nuisance to your neighbors. If it establishes in a cavity somewhere, it's going to be a competitor for resources competing with your hive. Most of the mites are left in the parent hive. Okay, only a small percentage of the mites leave the swarm because most of the mites are in the brood in the parent hive. So the parent hive is going to have a very, very high mite infestation rate of the adult bees, much higher after the swarm leaves than it would before the swarm left. And then if you're don't have mite resistant stock, which most of you don't, um, I assume. Um, if those swarms do establish and become a feral colony, they're not going to fight varroa and they're going to be varroa factories. And by late summer, then you're going to have a huge drift of mites back into your hives from those escaped 
swarms. So the last thing in the world that we want is swarms. We do everything we can to keep our colonies from swarming. And preventing swarming, that's like telling te teenagers, don't get too friendly, okay? You're, you're fighting hardwiring, biological hardwiring. You, it, it's not gonna work, okay? So your challenge is to balance the colony buildup versus triggering swarming. So understand the cues for, for swarming. There are things that you uh, can do. So understand the cues. What causes the bees to get ready to, to swarm? Okay, again, we have these two objectives. They want to propagate their genetics right here. And here are the triggers for the swarming impulse. Anything that makes them sense that the home cavity is being filled. Home cavity being your hive. Honeybees have no idea that you exist, have no idea that they're in an artificial uh, cavity. As far as they're concerned, they're living in a hollow tree. And when they feel like that hollow is being filled up with brood and, and honey, then there's nothing to do other than to reproduce the swarm. That adult to, be, to brood ratio, remember I said that when you shift from having more brood than adults to more adults than brood, that tells them that they've maxed out on brood production and now it's time to swarm. The amount of seal brood, they don't swarm unless they have a bunch of seal brood in the colony to leave a bunch of workers about to emerge for the colony that they leave behind. If they get to large, a large population, that dilutes the pheromone from the queens and they are able to sense that that pheromone has been diluted and they know that there uh, maybe it's time to swarm. And then the last thing is the young larva pheromone, the ibeta osamine, the, 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 the pheromone that the very young larvae put out. That, that tells every bee in the hive that the queen is functioning properly because they smell ibeta osamine, which means, oh, we have young larvae. The foragers know this, the mid-age bees know this, the nurse bees know it. They all know those young larva pheromone in the hive. If the colony plugs out full of brood and an incoming nectar, then there's no place for the queen to lay, and three days later, there's no young larval pheromone. That's a huge signal to the colony, it's time to swarm. So you don't ever want the queen to stop laying eggs, and that's why you add drawn comb to keep her laying eggs. If we look at Lloyd's data, this is your typical swarming period when you've topped out on your brood production. That's when bees swarm. So when they're building up, they don't, when they've topped out and reached their maximum brood, that's when they typically swarm. Now, if you look at a adult bee here on a frame, it covers roughly three brood cells crossways. So that means that a solid frame of sealed brood is gonna emerge into three solid frames of workers. This is 15,000 bees uh, that in the brood, not the ones on the surface that are gonna emerge. So when a colony swarms, they leave behind all the sealed brood and very, very quickly, the colony can recover its population. And here's a picture of your ratio of adult bees per um, cell of brood. So this is an even ratio. This is one would be the same amount of adult bees as you have um, uh, uh, brood. Um, uh, in the early on at uh, the spring turnover, you have way more brood or fewer adults than you have brood. As swarm impulse, that's when you peak, you have the most adults relative uh, to brood right, right there. So um, uh, it, or not the most, but a change right here. And then you get up to this huge, uh, many more adults than brood at the uh, peak honey flow here. But this is this, this transition to the um, swarm impulse. So you wanna keep a lot of brood in the hive to suppress the swarm impulse. So you wanna have plenty of queen pheromone, heavy, so uh, not remove excess adult bees and keep plenty of brood going. Here's your pheromones being diluted here by lots of adult bees. And here where you have backfilling with the fresh nectar coming in here, crowds down the brood nest, no place left for the queen to lay. This tells the colony it's time to swarm. So what can you do? You can shake bees off. Okay, into weak colonies, you can swap colonies, a strong, the positions of a strong colony, weak colony, let the weak colony pick up the field force of the strong colony. That's very easy, you don't have to go even open a hive. <clears throat> you can pull out frames of brood, give them to other hives. We do a lot of that, of, of brood swapping around. Or you can split your strong hives into two or more divides. So it's very important for the queen to have this drawn comb above or within 
be doing this. Now, nation does not count. Okay, you need to break the honey band here if you're going to put drawn combs. So put make sure that you um, mm -hmm. uh, put a drawn comb through the center here, so she has a high way to go up. Um, you know, also, if you're putting a queen excluder here, um, uh, when, if you're uh, splitting, if you're reversing your highs, they don't like to draw a foundation unless you have brood right up to that queen excluder. If you have this honey band up to the queen excluder, they don't like to hop on that foundation. So giving them room. When you put this box of foundation on top of this hive, in your mind, you have this vision that this is going to be drawn home someday and the bees will be happy. Unfortunately, those bees don't share that vision with you. They have no idea what you're thinking. To yeah. them, it's just space that maybe smells like beeswax, but this is not drawn comb. The queen cannot lay eggs immediately in here. So this may not, unless there's a nectar flow, enough for them to quickly draw and let the queen start working on it, this may not count for preventing swarming. So make a plan. It's all about uh, timing. Be, be proactive rather than reactive. Rear your own queen cells. I'm a big proponent of beekeepers just rearing their own queen cells, having them on hand, because that gives you a lot of, of options there. Split your hives before they, they swarm. It takes about two months for a five frame nuke to grow into a honey producer. So you want to split them early, early on. And then at the start of the honey flow, just combine your splits if, you, if necessary. So you prevent swarming by splitting your colonies, but you can put it back together when the honey flow starts. That also uh, solves the uh, the spousal problem, the spousal problem, and that um, if you split your hives every year, you get into this exponential growth of the number of hives, and pretty soon your spouse is saying, "Wait a minute, I thought this was going to be a hobby, and not that you're going to cover whole, <laughs> whole, whole property with with beehives here." So this is a huge tip right here: combine colonies back together at the beginning of the honey flow. You don't ever have to increase your number of colonies. Make huge colonies that make huge honey crops. So first pollen comes in here. You wanna let them build up. It takes, takes about 60 days until swarming. So you're gonna split them here, but you wanna have about eight weeks of buildup before the main honey flow. So make a plan like this, figure out what you're going to do in advance. Once you start seeing queen cells like this, it's too late. It's time that you, you're gonna to have to split them. You can't, you can't do any of the manipulations. You gotta take, take a nuke out or something. So let's talk about colony division. The first thing, learn to use queen excluders. When these crowded, crowded colonies, it's hard to locate the queen, especially if you're, if you're a beginner and have not located a thousand of the queens. You don't have that search image in your eyes. Very difficult. But you don't ever have to find the queen to make a split. All you got to do is pull some frames of brood out of the lower brood box of the hive and shake all the bees in the box. Then look at the frame, make sure the queen is not on the frame. She'll usually come off pretty easily. She's rarely the last bee to, to come off. So shake all the bees into the lower box of the hive. And then put a queen excluder above the lower box. Put your combs without bees above that. And the worker is going to walk right back up into these combs of brood that you put up here. It only takes about 15 minutes and they've got them all covered up again. And now what you're going to have is the queen trapped below. You've never seen the queen by shaking all the bees in the bottom box. Then, um, you know, uh, the queen's down there. It, and if you want, you can just put the lid upside down in front of the hive and shake all the bees in the lid, and they'll, they'll walk in there. Um, that's uh, another way to do it. <clears throat> and now you have a box full of bees and brood with no queen. Now I, you can take any of these frames out to add them to other hives, to make nukes, to make a new split, because now you have boxes of brood and queenless bees right here without ever having seen the queen. You can also use a sieve box. Okay, we take a medium super, Line it with a sheet of aluminum and screw a queen excluder to the bottom. And now you can just uh, shake bees into the sieve box over a, a, a colony. And the trick with this a sieve box is use only the slightest amount of smoke around the top edge. Don't blast the bees with smoke. If they surround them with smoke, you have, they have no idea which way to go. Just um, around the top edge. And then take a soft, the softest brush you can find. And actually, we usually cut, cut the handle off a bee brush and just tickle their backs. If you tickle their backs, that they just run right through the excluder. They don't want to be tickled on the back. Don't brush them, they just tickle them. So a tiny bit of smoke and tickle them, and bingo, they go right through the excluder. Very easy then to spot the queen, pick her up by the wings and do whatever you want with that queen. Put her back in the bottom box, um, make her into the nuke, whatever you want to do. 
Okay. Um, to the no shake method, you just go in, slide in the screen, screen excluder in between the two boxes, wait four days and come back. One box will have eggs and one box won't. You can then take the box with no eggs and move it to a new stand. Um, and uh, if, there's a, if there's queen cells from swarm cells or whatever, make sure there's one or, or two inside that box you move and then that colony will then <coughs> rear a, uh, a new queen. It's called a, a walk away, uh, a removed walk away split. The parent hive here will still be very strong, will still have the field force and old queen. So it's gonna need a whole box on top of it very quickly because they're gonna recover their strength very, very quickly. So you can, for the hobby beekeeper, the small scale beekeeper, you can kill several birds with one stone. Here's a technique, technique that's used in uh, Europe a lot. To, you can prevent swarming, requeen your colony, control varroa, make a big honey crop, avoid increasing your, your, your colony numbers all at one time. But what requires a quick sorting of brood frames. And I just filmed me doing this, um, but I haven't put it up on my website yet. I'll try to get a, a, a video up of me doing this. And it's on my first year beekeeping webpage. Look for this big yellow swarm and my control. We take your double deep colony, the queen, you split it into two boxes. The top, one box goes here, one box goes down here. The, you, you sort out the frames. No sealed brood in this box down here. The queen and no sealed brood. Just she can just get drawn home and honey. She doesn't need any any brood at all, but just no sealed brood, which means there's no mites can hide. So before you put the lid back on, give them an oxalic acid drill. Now you've prevented swarming, and you have a, a, a mite free, essentially mite free colony because you dribble it when there when there's no sealed brood. This stand right here is sealed brood and young bees. Leave the queen on the old home stands. The field force will come back to her. Let these young bees give them most all the seal brood, so they will rapidly um, <coughs> build build up. Give them a queen cell. Give them a swarm cell. Wait 18 days and then give them an oxalic acid dripper. You got a one day window when there's no no seal brood in the hive before the new queen starts laying eggs. At that point, you're going to have two colonies, each with the queen, a young queen and the old queen. You can either sell this one, make increase, or just put them back together and make a great big strong colony. And at that point now, you've, you, you've avoided swarming, you've requeened your colony, you've controlled Varroa, and you have not increased your colony numbers, and you're going to make a great big honey crop because you have a huge colony. Okay? And it only takes just a, a few minutes to do this. Okay. Um, so, and, and, okay, yeah, separate the seal brew and the open brew with two hives. Okay. So uh, other one, pictures, I don't know why I have this here. Okay, just shake all the bees into the lower box, queen excluder. So you make walk away, make uh, splits with queen cells, okay? So we, we keep queen cells on hand all the time during the season. We raise a lot of queen cells. If you make a walk away split, make, force the bees to raise their own queen cells, it's about 26 days until you have a laying queen again. That's a long break. If you can put a right queen cell or swarm cell in, is typically 10 to 12 days until you have eggs. Typically, we have a made out success if the weather's decent of about four out of five uh, nukes, about 80% will made out with good weather. So make extra splits, make more nukes than you need, make them weaker if necessary, and then combine them once they've made it out, okay? Don't think that every nuke's gonna successfully made out. So we make lots of smaller nukes, and then you can use them to make um, uh, uh, splits because you already have an already laying queen in those nukes. Now you can just add combs of brood from the other hives that are getting ready to swarm to these nukes that you've made and avoid swarming. And don't, you have a place, you then have a place to put all those frames of brood. <coughs> so some general suggestions for making splits. Leave your old queen on the original stand and pick up the field force. And this colony will recover very quickly because that queen's in full laying condition. Two weeks later, you won't even be able to tell that you split the colony. Give your seal brood uh, to the splits because um, any kind of nuke, what causes them to build up rapidly is the amount of seal brood you give to them. It's not the amount of adult bees you put in a, a split, it's the amount of seal brood, okay? Young bees, if you're gonna use a, 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 a cage queen that you're buying from somebody, young bees always accept a queen better 
than a older bees do. So you don't want to, to try to requeen the field forest still, uh, colony, the older bees, always requeen the split that's moved to a new location. Okay, so making nukes, any number of ways of making nukes. Here we are in our assembly line here. <clears throat> so number one, you can milk your strongest hives. Just pull individual frames of brood or steel bees from one, one or more. So here we're removing frames of brood and, and honey from a strong colony and put in back in drawn comb, and that will keep that colony uh, from swarming. Uh, you don't have to take the bees. Don't, you don't have to find the queen. Again, just shake, shake the bees off. Put an excluder on, let the bees walk up, and um, um, then you can pull this nuke off. So here I made a five-frame nuke of what I want to frame of honey on one side, draw on the other, three frames of brood, shook all the bees off, put it above excluder. 15 minutes later, bingo ready to take off, and now you can move this nuke to wherever you want, okay? And they don't have to come from the same hive. You can just make up a nuke from one hive with all the brood, with no bees at all, and then just put a clinic loader over another hive, and let the bees from the other hive walk up and cover these frames. Now you've reduced one hive by taking away brood, and the other hive by taking away nurse bees. And there's lots of tricks for, for, for splitting here. Okay, then however you make them, Divide your nukes up. We put them in pairs. So when you go to check for mate out and you have to squat down to check them, you only have to, you can check two with one squat. <laughs> um, let them sit for a day or two and then put in a ripe queen cell. <clears throat> Just shove it right in. We always touch the brood because if you put it up in the honey, the bees on a cold night, they may let this chill. So we always touch the queen cell to uh, brood. Okay. Oh, that, that, uh, second method split off a brood chamber or pull two nukes from a strong hive. So now what we've done, we've trapped the queen below by the shake method. Here's the big box right, right up here. And what you can do is you can make a two-way nuke field. Put a divider board in here and you can put it onto a, a hive stand with a entrance a reducer across the front with just an entrance on either side. And we put the um, brood towards the center here and then draw comb or honey towards the outside. And you can uh, made out two queens in one deep box, okay? It's a two-way nuke. Now, if you want to do it the quick way, because you're not, 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 both of them will not always made out. Once you see any queen laying, just pull the, the, the divider board out and because queens don't cost you anything at this point. You don't handle the queen. It costs you almost nothing to raise the queen. So we'll just pull the divider board out. Don't care if there's two queens in there. You're going to wind up with one queen generally. So here we have um, uh, putting the second box on above the excluder with the two nukes made up, honey, brood, 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 drawn comb, drawn comb, brood, 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 honey. So let the bees walk up and now you can pull the nuke out of here or pull the nuke out of, out of here and make two nukes into two separate nuke boxes. It, it's all up to you. There's no one way to make them. Now, the way we make nukes is called yard trashing. We wait till our colonies build up 20 frames covered with bees and we split them into five four frame nukes. 20 divided by five is four frame nukes. So, um, like my sons made 4,000 4, 4, nukes they, they made um, this year. We sell about 1,000 and we keep the rest um, for our, ourselves. Now, here's a big tip. Work away from the parent hive stand. This person over here, any bee that's gonna sting you or want to defend the colony, flies back to the hive, original hive stand. You can work without a veil on here much of the time because these bees here are, are not interested in defending. They want to defend the hive stand location. This, this beekeeper over here, my son, always has to wear a veil and often gloves over here because the bees are pretty defensive here. But he brings uh, all the hives over here for us to work on our fold up table here that we move from the yard to the yard. We set our hives on deboxers boxers and just push down in the box and pop up all the frames. So it's really easy to uh, pull them out. We set uh, nuke boxes ahead of us like this, and we fill them up with four frames. Notice how they're spaced. We space them because we always put the honey frame closest, <coughs> draw on comb furthest, and then two frames of brood. That means we don't even have to talk. We can reach side to side and fill each other's boxes. Once there's four frames in here, we shove them together and put the lid on it. And a, a third helper, they carry them away and replace them. And we just make these nukes just lickety uh, split. So typically, um, uh, my sons, they're making about 150 nukes an afternoon. So here's our typical setup on the stand. 
uh, just blast out making nukes. And we pile the nukes on the trucks and haul them to another yard for made out. If it's raining, it would have been easy if it was raining too hard. So here we're making nukes all day long in the rain. If it's snowing, we don't have any, it don't have to have these yet. We make nukes all day long if it's snowing. The weather doesn't make any differences. All the difference the weather makes is what kind of clothing we wear. We still do the same job. Now, you notice we, we only made four frame nukes, drawn comb, honey, and two frames of the queen cell right here. We need this space. This space makes it really easy to go back and put the queen cell in to check for <coughs> made out um, after a couple of weeks. If there's a nectar flow on, we'll drop a frame of foundation in here. Okay, otherwise we just put the four frames in. Third, the queen cell in, and then go back later and check for uh, made out. Two weeks later, you should have a laying queen if the weather's been uh, conducive. Now, if you missed, if you made a nuke and you missed the queen making it, it's very easy to tell in your yard the next day because some of these nukes will be just covered with bees. Uh, after two weeks, this, this nuke here will be wall to wall sealed brood and uh, with the older queen and uh, you can do whatever you want with that. You can split it back up or you can uh, just save that little queen and um, uh, start a very strong colony. These are, we have high demand for these nukes like this with the second year queen because they just take off uh, incredibly fast because of all the sealed brood. <clears throat> One thing things to do is then when you're looking for beta, there's some tricks. A lot of times at, after two weeks, you go in there and you go, wow, I don't see any eggs. Do I have a queen? And me and my sons, because we, we often have people helping us to watch these. Go, oh God, how can you tell? They'll say, well, I don't see a queen. I don't see eggs, but I'll bet you a hundred dollars if we come back in a week, there'll be a queen in here. And they go, how can you tell? But the first thing is, if they have a queen, the bees will form a tight cluster. They're just all over. They probably don't have a queen. If the bees are calm, their wings are not jittery. They seem really happy. There's no roar but the smoke. They probably have a queen who just hasn't started laying yet. The other thing, pull a cell out of the middle of what will be the brood nest. And if the cells are all polished and ready for eggs to be laid, they probably have a queen who hasn't started laying yet. <laughs> if they're putting nectar or pollen in the middle and filling it up, they're probably queenless. So we just flip the lid upside down and check back in a week if we feel there is likely a queen. And most of the time we're right. Some queens just take a while. Now you may have wondered why we only, why we make five four frame nukes. On average, I already told you, four out of five made out. One does not made out. So we take our five nukes with four frames. This is for you who are arithmetically challenged. Okay? I made a picture for you here. Five nukes, four frames each. Take these four frames from the one that did not made out and you fill in the fifth space and you wind up with four five frame queen right nukes. Okay. We wait 18 days. 18 days later, we drill them all with oxalic acid and we start off our whole operation pretty much free of Varroa every year by doing this. And I'll tell you right now, you haven't really experienced the joy of beekeeping until you rear your own queens and you pull out your, your these frames of brood from your new, um, new laying queens and just, man, I've been doing this for 50 years and I just, this still is my favorite thing every springtime is rafting queens, rearing these uh, daughters and seeing these brood patterns from our, my new daughters every year. They're just like my babies. So I, I highly recommend you to learn how to rear your own queens. Um, if your nukes are weak, your best bet to boost them is either give them a frame of steel boot or shake some bees out in front of the nuke. If you shake them into the nuke, you don't know how many were old bees that are gonna fly back home and how many were young bees. You can't tell who's gonna stay. If you shake them out in the, on a uh, upside down lid or a bottom board in front of that hive, any bee that walks in as a young bee, it's going to stay there. And you can then you have an eye, a visual of how many are actually going to go into that hive. Also, these bees don't tend to fight with anybody else. They're young bees. Any bees are going to fight the old bees. They just fly off. They don't bother to walk in. Again, the more brood in the nuke, sealed brood, the faster it will grow. This from uh, Wedmore, old manual beekeeping, almost every emergency of management can be met by putting something into or taking something out of a nucleus. While well, nuclei themselves seldom present emergencies, you can never have too many nukes on hand. It just gives you all kinds of options. Now, when you do start a bunch of nukes, 
And this is data I did from, I, I set up, I put 35 nukes in a yard. All the sister queens all graphed at the same time, all made it in the same yard. And I weighed them all in the beginning. And I weighed them after 35 days, after two months. And here's the histogram of their weight. So this at these numbers, number of highs add up to the 35 colonies. One of the 35, one colony here, gained less than 10 pounds and one gained between 40 and 50 pounds. They have a, notice the normal curve here. The average was 20 to 30 pounds weight gain, okay? Now, it's not your job to keep every poor colony alive. These are a waste of time to us. So these get combined with these right here and these are our potential breeders right here. So it's not, start with way more, don't expect every colony you start with to be a good colony. So just plan that you're gonna sacrifice, you know, a large number of them. And by sacrifice, I mean, you don't kill them, you just combine them with other uh, colonies and, uh, and get strong colonies out there. Strong colonies, stronger colonies make proportionally more honey than weaker colonies. So one super strong colony is gonna make more honey than two medium strength colonies. So at the beginning of the honey flow, we just combine all of our weaker colonies and make nothing but strong colonies then. And that gets us back to preparing colonies for the honey flow. That's it. Have big, strong colonies, especially with young queens at the beginning of the honey flow with no mites. Strong colonies, no mites, young queens, and you're off to make honey. I can answer questions if you have any. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Yeah. All right, you guys all, are your heads swimming? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, hey, Randy, can you see us? Yeah. All right. Questions? Yeah. Uh, if, if a colony gets honey mouth and it restricts the queen from laying. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, what can you do with the, the nectar that's stored in there? What you can do is you can stack it up higher and put some drawn comb below it. So the queen has room, room to lay. You can give it to an, to an other colony. I wish I had that problem more. <laughs> but uh, no, just, just, make, just raise it up high. The bees, ignore, bees naturally store nectar honey above the cluster, okay? They will always move up to that. They will abandon the bottom box. So um, uh, in many areas, your bottom box uh, by springtime has very few bees in it and just move that above the, the cluster. If you have extra honey, um, move it up and give them a box of drawn comb. Again, box of drawn comb are always your salvation. Uh, Randy, uh, what ratio of nukes do you take through the winter compared to your full-size production hives? You know, we're just, we're experimenting with that. We're, we, our area is tough because any nuke that started um, after uh, the middle of June um, just does not grow because we're, we're, in, we're in drought. We've been in, we're going into our 17th year of drought here in California. This is the worst drought in well over a thousand years in, I think it's 1500 years in California. It's just miserable. So it's so dry during the summer. So I see these people can start nukes in August and I just en envy them. So we've experimented with it a bit, but um, I'm not an expert on it. We have our friends up like British Columbia and stuff that they w winter big banks of, of nukes over the winter, pack them side by side, put some insulation over the top of them and they winter very, very well. So that would be an ideal thing to do. A lot of Canadians uh, do that, but I don't have enough experience to talk about overwintering nukes. I've got a question. If, if you have an excess of pollen, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, nectar, I mean, nectar, can that be frozen and reintroduced into the hive at some point later on? Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. So there's, uh, when, you're, when you're making splits, Randy, the, yeah. sometimes we try to put them in different yards or move them, especially if you're doing a lot of them. Is it okay to keep in the same yard, even though they're? Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have your field force. <coughs> excuse me, fly back home. It's 
It works best if you move them to another yard. But for the hobbyist, you can do them just in the same yard. Like I said, give them lots, make them put all your nurse bees and, um, um, and most of your brood in the splits. Shake them really full of bees because the, the older bees are all going to fly back to the parent colony. So just leave the queen in the parent colony with that field force because she's in, in full laying condition. It's amazing how quickly it will recover. I didn't, I took some pictures out of here. What we do sometimes is we buy like 500 pounds of bulk bees and we will we'll take double deeps um, of drawn comb if we have them. And if there's a nectar and pollen flow on, and if we have extra queens, we'll put a queen into every double deep of drawn comb. No bees, just a double deep drawn comb. And then you dump 10 pounds of bulk bees in front of everyone. Now, I have pictures of doing this. It's pretty impressive to, just to dump 500 pounds of bees on the ground in a, in a yard, okay? Those bees smell the queen. They walk in there, and you have, uh, it takes a half pound of bees to cover a frame, a deep frame on both sides. 10 pounds of bees covers every frame, both sides, in a double deep. You have, and if that's queen, it's a laying queen, in two weeks, it looks like that's just a full tilt colony. It's just amazing how fast you, you can you can build build them up. I can't remember what your question was. It, it had to do with that. <laughs> you answered it. Thank you. Okay. This. What type of pollen uh, substitute or supplement did you use? Or do you make your uh, <laughs> Tell you what, why don't you uh, go on my website and read my recent research on uh, my testing and pollen subs. I, I don't uh, make recommendations. How are you um, making but, but, I, but I, I have hard data uh, on of, of the comparing the various ones on the market. Okay. And I also have a pollen sub calculator. My, my recent research is finding out that I, I found the, I could, pre, my, I could predict by reading the analyses of all the subs I, I tested, how well they perform based upon their amino acid ratios. And I've sent that information to all the manufacturers and I have a free online calculator that you can make up any pollen sub you want, put in the ingredients and, and balance it for amino acids. So um, I'm hoping this is going to, uh, uh, it, improve pollen subs across the market. Are you mixing dry sub with honey or with syrup? We uh, don't mix. We, we mixed ours for a long time, but then um, because there's so much pollen sub being bought by beekeepers in California, the manufacturers have, been, have worked with us. And um, we always, we're in transition right now after that trial when we, when we found the results of that. The sub that we've been using for a number of years, um, we're thinking about, uh, are we actually shifted from that one and hope that they, uh, I hope to collaborate with them for them to improve their sub. And I'll go back to that one because we like the bulk, the bulk sub that we get, uh, get in uh, 50 pound boxes. You dump it out and you cut it up with a spade so you can put the chunks in the hive. Yeah. If you're using the Queen cells from your own hive, taking a frame and moving it to another uh, nuke or whatever to start another. Yeah. Are there times when you have to be careful how you handle that frame? That it, yeah, you don't want to drop them. Okay, you, <laughs> drop them, you drop them from a few feet and the queen pupa is about day 10. Her wings uh, are forming at that time, her wing pads. And at day 10, they are fragile for being dropped. But if you're not dropping them, no, you don't have to, uh, don't have to be careful. And I also I also have a, a whole PowerPoint um, mm. and instructions on my website on called Queens for Pennies, which shows you how to raise a, a dozen queens for a few pennies very easily. A dozen queens. Anybody can raise a dozen queens, uh, uh, queen cells very easily. So just be proactive. You know, uh, you know, we usually put our queen cells in on day 10 after grafting. So 10 days before you want to make your splits, you just start a batch of a dozen queen cells. It's very easy. Go ahead. Others answered all your questions. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but I got a bunch of questions still. Or, or and, and you know, we, we always tell everybody, stay out of your hives when it's snow and cold in winter, and you guys are at Carhartt's just ripping hives apart. Does that happen? We, we work a lot faster than you do. <laughs> <laughs> None of those frames are exposed to the elements for more than a few seconds. 
if you watched us working, it would blow your mind how fast you can split a colony into uh, five nukes in the box, have them sealed up. There's no chilling of anybody involved. You're, you're filming that with high-speed cameras. <laughs> yes, high-speed cameras, yeah. We've been doing this for a long time. Any others? All right. Is that it? All right. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, happy beekeeping to you. Thank you very much. You bet. Have a good day. Thanks.